I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about Belgrind. Belgrind is, a, is an amazing set of tools. Um, several years ago, it, it won some pretty prestigious awards too for, for what it did. Uh, it, and it, it can make your life a lot easier. Uh, I've certainly used it lots of times. There's a certain classes of problems and bugs that can be extremely difficult to solve. Uh, and we'll, I think you'll gain an appreciation for that as we go through this presentation, if, if you don't have it already. Um, and Belgrind can make your life a lot easier this way. Um, and a secondary sort of item I want to address in, in this presentation also is to, to perhaps remove some of our, our black box understanding of, of how computers and programs work to, to give you a, a, a fairly accurate model of, of what's actually happening under the scenes, which can uh, give you a better appreciation for for what can go wrong and, and maybe some uh, ability to reason when things are going wrong to, to try and guess what uh, what the problem might be. Uh, so let's get going here without uh, further delay. So just a quick notes here. Um, modern computers are, are binary systems, so um, technically most of the, that is, they're based on, on switches, so on or off is the two options. So most things are actually powers of two, so technically 1,000 is 1,024, but uh, for this presentation, I'm, I'm not going to bother being that precise about that, because uh, that's just a, a detail. Uh, so let's start by talking about the memory, and I'm going to try and uh, slow the presentation down a little bit here by by drawing the the diagrams here on the right as we go with it. So um, the memory in your computer, modern computers, actually von Neumann machines are, are closely based on that model of Lacrosse. So there there is essentially a large one-dimensional array. Um, and each entry in this array is one byte, as it happens historically. One byte has, has sort of coalesced on a group of, four, of eight switches together. So the number of total possible combinations those switches can be in is 2 to the 8 or 256. So the actual machine memory um, consists of a, a one-dimensional array going from starting at, at uh, address 0. Here, let me just draw this on this side of the picture here. So if we want to look at the physical memory of your computer, uh, it looks like this. It's a large one-dimensional array. Um, and it starts at address 0. And it continues on down to however much memory you have in your computer, so uh, a modern machine. Um, very reasonable, probably has maybe even 16. I'll just put 8 gigabytes here. Um, and then each entry in this array is a single byte. Um, and, and so it can have, from a, if you want to look at, think of it in terms of a mathematical structure, uh, an array, and each entry is a number between 0 and 255. Uh, now, these memory locations are, are grouped into what are called pages. Uh, traditionally, a page on, on a Intel-based computer is uh, 4,000 bytes in a page. Um, so this memory is all chopped up into pieces, and each piece contains 4,000 bytes. And so on down. And uh, early in the day of days of computing, this is actually how your programs ran. When you ran a program, it would be loaded off disk into one of these memory regions, and uh, it would run in there, and it would it would manipulate another memory region. So one, the, you know, like the the data might wind up, the code might wind up here, and then the data would run up here, and then some scratch space here, and it would manipulate it and and solve the answer to the problem. Um, and if another program was loaded, it might be in a different area. And the problem with that design was uh, my program could very easily interfere with your program. There was no barriers between them. Um, if I, my program happened to generate a, an array 
a memory index that landed inside your program, um, I could change values in your program and cause your program to crash. So it's very hard uh, to, to put much complexity in there before little errors cause catastrophic failures. Um, so fairly quickly when we have started having multiple, uh, supporting multiple users and multiple programs, um, they partitioned address space and, and they did a mapping. So each program got its own virtual address space and its view of memory was just that. And then that kept the programs aside. So a typical program here would be running and its view of the memory would be like this here again. Um, and this would be a virtual address space, they'd call it. It would go from uh, from zero being the first entry down to the size of the the, the register. So a modern computer, that's two to the 64. That's truly a huge number. Um, and this was also broken up into 4K chunks. And then when your program um, accessed an area of memory, the computer maintained a set of tables that told it where that uh, where that memory was coming from. So say I, I generated, I asked, so okay, I want the, the memory content at uh, address 4000, so that falls in this 4K chunk, and there'll be a table on the computer that'll actually tell it, okay, that memory is being filled here by this physical memory. So my program generates this, the computer looks up the, the table uh, entry for that, and it goes and access the physical memory here. And uh, so this had several advantages. You can see uh, the program always got the nice same linear view of, of memory, no matter how many times it was run. And then by keeping these mappings distinct between programs, um, this 4K chunk here, uh, my program can't access because there's no mapping that takes me back. So by, by taking actual physical memory and assigning different chunks of it to different programs and not providing my program with any mappings to physical memory that's in your program, my program is isolated for your, from your program. And that's why nowadays when your program crashes, usually it's just that program that crashes. You know, you get a segmentation fault, that program dies, it's fine. In the old days, uh, if you got a segmentation fault like that, it very well could have toasted several other programs and your computer might have needed rebooting. And uh, of course, this, this whole mapping here is maintained by your operating system. In our case, we're talking about Linux. So that's sort of the, uh, the big picture of, of memory here. And I kind of got ahead of my slides here. Uh, but this is what I was talking about. So again, the program memory is, so real memory is a dense 1D array. So every, every entry up to the size of however much memory you have is filled. The program memory is a sparse uh, 1D array. So it's got little bits and chunks that have been mapped, that map back to real physical memory. And there's a couple of points here that once you see this picture become obvious, and that is, um, there's holes in here, right? Like this one here doesn't have any memory in it. So what happens when my program tries to access, generates an address and says, give me the memory at this spot. The, uh, the processor looks it up and it says, oh, the operating system hasn't assigned any memory there. Well, that's when my program segment faults. So that's when you, when you run your program and you get a segment fault, that's what's happened. Uh, your program has generated an address and that address goes to a spot that doesn't, has not been assigned memory by the operating system. And then the operating system knows your program has a bug in it um, and it terminates it. But the important, one of the very first important points I wanna impress upon you is there's lots of ways the program can go wrong that does not involve it hitting a spot here. Like say I generate a faulty address and by chance, that happens to land on a spot that has been assigned memory. Uh, there's no segment fault, right? We frequently receive, we, we see as assertions of uh, people say, well, my program doesn't segment fault on my computer, um, so there's gotta be something wrong with your cluster. And 
in 99.9% .9 of the cases that it's not, uh, it's not the cluster that's at fault. What has happened is just on a different computer, uh, depending on the circumstances and how the programs ran, different areas will be free filled in at different points. And uh, it just so happens that you, the bug on their computer lands in a region that has memory in it, and the bug on our computer lands in a region that doesn't have memory in it. So it segment faults in one case, and in the other case it doesn't segment fault. But in both cases, the program is wrong because it has it has addressed uh, trying to access an array, for example, address past the end of the array. One time it got lucky um, and hit an unmapped region, so it crashed and that exposed that bug. Another time it got unlucky, hit an a, a, a region that had the other memory there, has written into it, and who knows what that's going to affect the results or not, um, but it didn't crash. So I just wanted to impress upon you as a, our first item here that there's lots of ways the program can fail um, and still be at, at fault here. So let me, I'm just going to save this, uh, this diagram here. Um, so this is the physical memory. Just so I can go back to it later, we're going to go through several examples. Um, and so now, so another picture of it. Let's talk about the actual layout of the program memory. So you can see how the, the physical to program memory goes, but there's a structure imposed on this eight region of memory here as well, uh, which is what I want to go into next. And uh, that structure was standardized uh, many years ago, or at least there's several standards for it, but the one that's used under Linux is the uh, ELF standard. I believe it stands for executable and linking format or something like that. Um, released in some of the early Unixes by at and and some uh, microsystems of the time. Um, and so I, the, the picture we're getting here as we go along is there is uh, there's increasing structure so that the, the general computer, the von Neumann machine, if you will, is, uh, is a fairly um, loose uh, description of the program, right? You have this big area of memory. In the memory is instructions. In the memory is data. Uh, the processor looks at the instructions and runs them. They manipulate the data uh, into the, uh, the end result, which is printed out on your screen or shown on a display. Uh, but you have to impose a lot of structure that to get on top of that to get to this modern uh, view where we have our compilers and stuff. And one of them is how that memory is laid out. Um, so the memory, actual memory layout here looks like this inside a program. So we'll just call this here um, program memory. Um, and this is actually quite a long diagram here, so I'm just going to so this is our one-dimensional array again that is uh, chunks the sparse array mapped to the, the physical memory. Um, so up at the top here is a whole region that has no uh, physical memory assigned to it. So this is known as the, the null space, um, so it's unmapped. And the reason for that is a very common error in programs is to uh, Use, you've got these pointers, if you're familiar with C, which is basically an address, and then you say, okay, at this pointer, give me the value, um, is to forget to initialize those pointers. And frequently, uninitialized memory is zero, in which case, if you use one of those uninitialized pointers, it'll hit this null area. Or if you index off it, it's a fairly large region that's left unmapped, so you'll fall inside this null, and that guarantees you'll generate a segment fault. So that's just by convention, and that's just to catch a very common set of segmentation of, of programming errors and make sure they generate a segment fault so the user knows about it. Uh, so anyways, following this null region here is a region that has the code. So this is the actual instructions that the processor will look at that will tell it what to do. Uh, there's, if you want to look up, they're called assembly language. There will be instructions to do additions. There's instructions to load from memory and to store from memory and to do multiplication and stuff. So your compiler looks at your code and it translates it into these uh, these set of set of instructions. Uh, I always like to think of it as like a your program is like a high level description of your problem, and then you know the compiler turns it into muscle movements. Uh, uh, that sort of level of detail, 
And so when your program's load ran, uh, the operating system loads this into memory and it points the processor at the starting part of your code and tells it to run it. Now your program runs along, it's gonna need to manipulate data um, to do in order to do the, con the calculation. And there's several variants of data. There's a constant data. So this is data that you have declared in your program. And uh, this data is known to not change throughout the life of your program. So there's a set special region inside your program that's set aside for that. And the reason um, it, the, these things are set aside, as I mentioned over on this side here, um, not only are these 4K regions have memory assigned to them, but there's limitations set on what the processor is allowed to do. So the code region is flagged as being re only, you're only allowed to read from it and you're only allowed to execute it. And what that does is that prevents some of these oversight errors. So if I, in my code, I happen to try to get a wrong address and wind up trying to write to a code area, the processor says, oh, something's gone wrong. There should be no writes going to the code. Um, and it will segment fault. And this is marked as executable too. So if something goes wrong and it goes down here and tries to execute, interpret uh, one of those numbers from zero to 255 as an instruction and execute it, it'll say, whoa, that region of memory, that's marked as read only. Um, you should not be trying to execute there. It'll generate a segment fault in order to help me. Um, so the constant data, and so if you have data that's not changed in the life of your program, and there's some way, uh, like in the C, when you declare the type, you can declare it as a constant type. That's always a really good idea. That'll cause it to wind up in this area, and then your program won't be able to write to it. So that'll catch any class of bugs, bugs where you accidentally write to that. Um, underneath the constant data, we have the mutable data. So this is data that you've declared in your program, um, but it's, it's not marked as constant. So it'll show up here, it'll be initialized to whatever the initial value is you set in your program, but it'll be marked read and write. So the program, as it, it runs along, it will be able to um, overwrite this. And then as we know, there's two types of, of data. There's data that you pre-declared and you know, for example, arrays, you know the size of and stuff. Um, and then there is data where you don't actually know you're gonna to have to, it depends on maybe the input to the program, exactly how much memory you need, um, the phase the program's in. And that's what we call allocated data. So right down here, the remaining set is uh, allocated. Allocated. And they traditionally refer to this as the heap. Um, and so as your program runs, it says, I need memory. You make an operating system call and say, give me, add some more physical memory in. So initially there will be no allocated memory. Uh, your program will run around, say it's a C program, it calls Melek, um, that gets handed over to the operating system, says put one of those 4K chunks of, of memory in here. So it'll add it in, you'll use that up, uh, you'll ask for some more memory, another 4K chunk will get chunked into it. So this here continues on down and underneath it is a potential heap. So as you need it, the operating system is called and the memory is added in here. But initially when your program starts running, there is no memory added here. So this only gets added as you require. All right, and so there's a big long space uh, range of, of, of array addresses reserved for that. And then we continue on down here let me just make that a little wider, actually. Um, continue on down here. Um, and at some point, your program uses libraries. Um, so I've, I've, I've got other code. So this is the code that's in my program, and then there's the code from the libraries I'm using. So when the program gets run, both the program and the libraries need to be put in. So it uh, further on down in your program is where it shoves in the library. And this just essentially repeats this. So we got the library, say this is the first library, library one, it's got the code. Uh, and then underneath the code, it'll have the constant data, 
And then underneath the constant data, it'll have the mutable data. And uh, any allocations run by the, this library, because it's running in the context of your program, will get pulled out of the heap. Um, so then this will be repeated again here for library two and library three and however many libraries you have. And then uh, there's another region of the program here getting right near the end here. Um, and this is what they call the stack. So as your program, as the functions in your program run, uh, each function needs a certain amount of storage space. Um, it needs storage space for its local variables. It needs storage space for the arguments that were passed to the function. It needs scratch space um, just even for the computations that are going on in the functions. The processor has a fixed number of, of ability to store numbers. So if your routine uses more numbers than that, it may have to store them in some scratch space. So that'll go on this. And they call that the stack. And it's down here. And then the stack as you call functions, uh, or also recorded on the stack, is when I call a function, I stick on there the address to return to. So that's how the return statement works. It goes and looks up that address, and it jumps back and starts executing. So the stack is as I call a function, uh, it has to add its uh, local storage on top of mine, so it makes another entry on the stack. And then that calls another function, will make another entry on the stack. So the stack uh, kind of grows in the opposite direction of the heap. Um, and again, this is above it is potential stack. So as functions are called, the operating system will um, allocate memory into here to, to meet the demands for those. Um, and again, initially, this is unmapped. And it used to be in the old days that the heap grew down, the stack grew up, and you didn't have any library code. You just had static binaries. And eventually, if they met in the middle, then bad things happen. Um, but with libraries now, we have library code in here. And uh, our address space is, is uh, 0 to 200, 2 to the 64. So this is huge. You're, you're, you, will <laughs> you're, you will exhaust all the physical memory on your machine long before um, there's any collisions caused in here. Uh, and then just right down at the very bottom of your program, okay, there's a special area reserved for the kernel interface. So the kernel um, sticks some code in. Uh, in every program that runs. Um, and that's used for interfacing with the kernel. And by, by not baking this code into the executables, that uh, makes it easier for the, the, the uh, operating system to be updated, because then you don't have to go update all the programs. So this is, this is a, a library, actually, for interfacing with the kernel. And it's, it's supplied by the kernel, and it just so happens to sit down here. And then finally, at the end, we have a little region of unmapped again. which can catch things like negative indexes, uh, which will wrap around and come up, up the bottom side. Uh, now, the key thing about all this is, is when, I add, when, I, when I make an address, um, the, the system does not care. So long as it gets me the value at that point, so long as, as my operation matches the conditions. Um, so any of these areas here I can read from. So if I happen to calculate an address incorrectly, I fall into, say, library one's code, and I ask for, for the byte that's at a certain address, it'll go get it. It, it doesn't care that uh, my calculation was wrong. So the only things that generate segment faults is if I hit one of these potential stack areas or potential heap areas that don't yet have memory associated with them, or if I happen to be performing a write and I hit, say, the constant data area or a code area. Everything else will not generate a segment fault. So I hope you can understand that there's, there's many, many ways the program can be wrong um, without generating a segment fault. I had heard somebody once say that uh, you know, a segment fault indicates there's a problem with the program. It, it does. But it, uh, a non-segment fault, also your program might be 
might be wrong. So don't rely on the fact your program is not generating segment faults to assume that everything is okay. Um, and now some interesting items here. If you have an executable, you can use this read elf program with the minus T flag. will actually show you um, this sort of layout in the program. Or if you have a program that's running, you can actually look at under the, there's a directory called proc and then your process ID. So that's just the number of the process. There's a maps file. If it's just a text file, if you look it out, the kernel provides a listing of, of these areas um, and and what the flags are, how big they are, and so on. So if you're interested in digging into it, there's some um, very useful tools. And there's a diagram again. Uh, so next I want to go in here and I want to talk a little more about the heap. So what this actually looks like, this area here, um, as, it, as it's being allocated, how it grows down. Um, because the allocations are made dynamically at runtime, there's also a bunch of bookkeeping that goes around here. So there's bookkeeping records in here. Um, that, and those records are used by the library uh, that runs your program. So, so usually that's the C library. And, uh, and if you happen to, to write something on top of some of those records, your program can fail in a spectacular manner at some later point. Um, so let me just save this one here first so I can refer to it later. Program. Let's have a look at what the heap looks like. Um, now the heap, of course, the structure imposed on the heap is, is that, uh, that by your allocation routine. So this is typically malloc and free in C, uh, new and, and uh, delete in C++, um, which usually new and delete are sit on top of malloc and C. So the one I'm going to describe to you is called uh, the Doug Lee malloc routines. So that's DL malloc is what it's known on. And this was the one that uh, was incorporated into the GNU C library. So this is uh, the glibc, uh, sorry, a modified version of this one was um, the glibc heap. And if you actually look up the glibc heap or glibc malloc, uh, you can find their wiki has a, a very interesting talk about it. So when you allocate um, uh, ask for memory, the, the malloc routine first goes to the kernel and well, checks to see what it's got. And if, if there is no memory there, it'll go to the kernel and say, okay, please stick one of those 4K chunks in there. Um, that'll add a chunk in there, so physical memory assigned to it. And then it'll put a bookkeeping record around your allocation request. So your allocation request will say, look like this, we'll just draw a box. All right, and then uh, at the front of the, the chunk, it'll have a record in here that has the, the, the size of the chunk for its own records um, and some flags, some status flags. All right, and then underneath that, will be the, the actual address. So this is, this is what it's allocated. Underneath that will be the actual address it returns to you. It'll say, oh, here's the memory you asked to, and it'll give you this here. Um, so when you write into this memory, this is where your data will go. So user data. Now you specified how much memory you need. So at the very end of it here, it also puts another record, which is a, another copy of the chunk size. And right away, you can see um, if I access past the end of the array, I access out of the over the memory uh, that I actually required, which I can generate that. Um, depending on how far, I'm going to overwrite this record, which will cause problems. Or if I access past the start of my array, I'm going to overwrite this record, which will cause problems. And I won't see that, right? That's not going to generate a segment fault. There's memory there. Uh, but at some point later when I go to free that memory or I go to allocate new memory and that malloc routine uh, steps through these records expecting that to be intact, uh, my program will crash or generate a scary uh, error message. 
And that'll be very hard to debug because where the error was, where I indexed out of the bottom of the array or out of the top of the array, is entirely in a different spot and you know could have been code that ran a long time ago from the, the one that actually explodes, which is the next call to memory allocation at some point in your program. Uh, so this is what an allocated chunk looks like. At some time you call free. Um, typically our allocations are not 4K blocks, uh, in which case uh, there will be some of these chunks back to back and you free one in the middle, it can't return that full 4K to the kernel. Uh, so instead it just leaves the physical memory remains assigned to the chunk. And what we wind up with instead is a, a, it sets some flags, one of the flags there to mark and say, oh, okay, this chunk is no longer in use. Um, and we wind up with an unallocated chunk of memory record. Uh, in this case, it keeps the the first one here, which so we still have the the chunk size record up at the top and the status and the same at the bottom. The copy of the chunks size here. But in, in this case, in order to uh, to speed future allocations, it uh, the, it retains a linked list, a doubly linked list actually, of uh, records of a certain size. So it's got these power of two bins um, that it retains it retain, retains records to. And so it'll go and I'll say, okay, the user's done with this region. They're not going to be writing any more data. So I'm going to use it for, for some of my own records. Um, so it's going to add to the very start here. It's going to add a next free chunk link. So this is the double link. in the link uh, for the particular size here that the bucket of sizes this falls in. And then since it's a doubly linked list underneath that, it's going to add a previous free chunk size record. Uh, and then under here will be just remaining uh, unused area. You can see here's far further opportunity for your program to fail. If your program says, oh, I'm done with this data, um, then it gets passed back to the glibc says, oh, I'm going to add it into my list of free data. So I'll write these records in here. Now my program lied. It wasn't actually done with the data. And instead it still reads from say the array that was in there. If it reads far enough down in the array, it'll land up in this area. Um, and it'll get the previous values. So it'll appear to be okay. If it reads at the start of the array, it's going to be reading what it thought was its value, but instead is the address of the next free chunk of this particular size and the program will be getting bad data. Uh, and so why is these chunk sizes? So actually, if we actually look at how this looks in memory, um, we have our heap here. So the start of our heap and, and then we have these records that are just back to back. So um, say I'd allocated some initial memory and then I unallocated it at some time. So I'll have an unallocated record um, and then that'll butt up against the next record, which might be an allocated record. And that's why there's a chunk size at the top and bottom. So from this chunk here, uh, the system knows it can back up just to the next record and it can get the size of that chunk, which allows it to calculate where it starts as well. So by putting the chunk size at the top and bottom, it allows it to walk up and down here, as well as once it's free, it can use these links here to, to, uh, to quickly look up the next um, one of the, the specific size. It's an allocated record and, and you know, this here just goes on and on. Um, until at some point there's some threshold in here. Um, so yeah, so maybe, you know, we have another unallocated and then maybe another allocated. And when I request memory, of course, it tries to use fill in these chunks, right? So if I'd requested a big area of memory and another big area of memory, and then I released the first one, um, 
can't hand this back to the operating system. So the next bit of memory I request, it tries to give me this one here. And only when it doesn't have any unallocated blocks that fits, it'll call the operating system and I'll say, oh, add another 4K chunk onto the bottom so I can continue giving the user memory. So under here, we have potential memory. Um, so this is memory that has, these are 4K chunks down here that have not had any uh, assignment made to them yet. Um, so here's the memory, and, and if we look at this, let's talk about uh, some of the things that can go wrong here. Uh, one obvious thing that can go wrong here is if I just keep, my program just keeps allocating and allocating and allocating and allocating memory without ever releasing any memory, um, eventually, I, you know, I have to keep calling the operating system saying, go give me another 4,000 bytes, give me another 4,000 bytes, give me another 4,000 bytes. Eventually, the operating system will say, I'm sorry, there, your program is not allowed to have any more memory or I've used all the memory, you can't have any more. Um, and then your program will die because it ran out of memory. And frequently, uh, people forget to actually check their memory calls so that if you look up the manual for malloc, you'll see it returns to say whether it was successful or not. So if you don't check it, um, usually it gives you back a zero, and then you address that, you hit that special region at the front of your program that is, uh, is left blank for that very reason, and your program will segment fault. Um, another problem is, when you're calling these routines, so it gives you a, an area of memory, it gives you one of these, you call free, uh, you have to give it this spot here because it has to be able to back up one entry and, and be able to find the chunk size. If you pass it some, some invalid address, like say the middle of the user data space, it backs up, it takes this as the chunk size, um, and then it, you know, it, it totally messes up its ability to determine where these boundaries are. Um, so there's an item that can do it. Uh, and another item is earlier in your program's execution, when there isn't much allocated, uh, if I step past the end of my region, I'm very likely to hit this area of potential memory that has no memory assigned to it yet, so my program sag faults. Much later in my program's execution, when there's been a whole range of allocations and deallocations and there's a, a large number of these 4K chunks allocated up the top, if I step outside of the boundaries of, of my array, uh, I'm probably just going to land in some other memory that is being used for some other purpose in my program. I will silently change those values and my program will die spectacularly. But it won't die spectacularly immediately. Where it will die is when it needs those values and discovers they're corrupted. So the program will crash, but trying to determine why it crashed is very hard because all you'll know is, oh, this value here, uh, when you get in your debugger, it crashed here, and you'll look at that value, and you're like, huh, that's an odd value. That, and you look at your code in your program, and you say, you know, that doesn't make any sense. That's not what I initialized. I can't understand how it got that way. And the reason it got that way is because somewhere else, some other place in your program, it's stepping outside the bounds of an array. Um, and then, too, if you happen to step on one of these 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 uh, record keeping um, then you screw up the memory allocation system at some point later when an allocation is done and, and then you have a, a truly horrendous mess uh, so the point i want to underline here is the source program problem in these cases is usually not where the program dies which make these debugs very very difficult to track down and there's a lot of non-determinism here too right like um i address past the end of my array, uh, it depends on the entire history of the program, all the prior allocations, the, you know, um, some of the defaults the operating system have and stuff, on to whether I step into, say, uh, a, an unallocated chunk and I happen to time it just right so I fall into this unused area, no damage, uh, the program continues, gives me the results, it looks to run okay. Different day, different computer. Um, I happen to land onto one of these records and screw it up and the program crashes. All right, so now that is the, the heap. Um, and now I'm gonna to wanna to talk to you about the final part in this here. <laughs> and, uh, and then we're going to get into actually looking at some of these errors in actual code and uh, how the program, you know, 
how these very things I've been telling you about, it, it seems to be running, how different values are corrupted, and how running it under bell grind in a large number of cases uh, will show these errors to us. Um, so the final part of, of, the, uh, of the puzzle here I want to talk about is the stack area. So if you remember right, the heap area was that area that was growing down. The stack area is the area that's going up, and that's used to implement the function calls. So that on the stack, uh, let me just draw my picture here so I can draw while I talk. Uh, so the stack, the stack looks like this. So we got the stack. Uh, and this again is, is the, the program's address space. Uh, and this is at the end of the program's address space. And each function call um, allocates a chunk of the stack. And, and it, what this does is this grows up as you call functions. So you call my, my main functions, usually the start, and then it'll call, say, some other functions. So that'll get added on the top, which will call another function. It'll get added on the top. That function will return, so I don't need it anymore. So I'll move my stack back down. Um, so there's a very na natural uh, first in, last out attribute to the stack, um, which fits very well with function calls. Um, so when a function is called, the stack here is extended. And the first thing that's put on the stack, so by extended, I mean the system checks. It says, OK, is there memory allocated there? If not, I'll call the operating system and get some uh, physical memory stuck in there. Uh, and now once I've got the memory, I'm going to start setting up this next function to run. Uh, now we're going to return to my previous function, so its area has to remain intact. Um, so the first thing I'm going to stick on here is the arguments to that function. So I'm going to, I'll stick the argument, uh, the last ar argument on first. Uh, whether it's the last argument or the first argument, the exact order they're stuck in, that the coding used, uh, that's known as the call convention. Uh, I'm showing here the standard uh, C call convention used under Linux. Um, so in this case, we stick the arguments on from the right-hand side. Uh, and that has reasons to do with supporting variable argument calls. Um, so there they are. They go on from the, the most right one to the most left one. Um, and then on the top of those, we put the return address. So this says, OK, once you're done running, you know, when you call that return call, um, where do, where do we go? How do we get back to where we were before? Well, this has the location of the next instruction to execute in the, in the function that called us. Um, and then inside our functions, we have local variables. You know, at the top of our function, we might say int i. Um, so that i has to be stored somewhere in memory. And uh, that i only lasts for the duration of that function call. So the very logical spot is to store it is, and, and each invocation of that function gets a new i, right? So the logical spot to store it is on the stack, and that is the case. So we've got uh, the local variables. So local variable one. Um, and these here happen to go the other way around. So the first local variable declared goes immediately above the return address, and then all the way on up to however many local variables I've declared in my program. Uh, and then finally, on top of that is some scratch space. So as the function runs, uh, it may say, for example, not have uh, the, the processor has a certain number of uh, internal registers for storing numbers and doing the arithmetic and stuff. There might not be enough while it's evaluating an expression. So it might just temporarily stick some stuff in the top of there. And then finally, above all this here is uh, up here, we have some more potential stack space. Or you know, if, uh, if I'm several calls in and then I've returned, this will be previously used stack space. Huh. And now all the data associated with one invocation of a function here is known as a stack frame. <laughs> 
So if you load your code into your debugger, you'll find there's ability to backtrace, they'll call it, and you can specify the frame, and it'll take you back through the functions calls that led to the current function. And as you jump into them, you can look at each of their own local variables and so on. So that's what the stack looks like. Um, and uh, we can look at this, and this gives us some of the ideas of what can go wrong. Um, in particular, invalid reads here. Um, typically, we address going down. Uh, addressing past the end of the array is much more likely. In this case, unless I happen to go all the way through all the function calls, uh, my read is most likely going to succeed. There are no holes going down here unless I reach out past the end of the entire stack. Um, invalid writes, if I write past the end here, uh, I'm going to tramp on, on stuff with functions that have called me, right? So this function calls me, my function does something, and it can actually, if I address out here, I can go in and I can change its local, the local variables in the function that called me. I can change local variables in the function that called the function that called me. Uh, so you can imagine how hard that is to debug. And whether it matters or not is going to depend entirely on, on the structure of that function, right? If that function had an I, it used the I, it's done with it, it calls me, I destroy its I, no big deal. If that function had a variable I, it used it, uh, it called me, I destroyed it, and then we come back to it, and it still needs to use that I uh, to continue its computation, say it's accumulating some sum, I've corrupted its results. So this function, this bad function that's accessing past the end of one of its local variables, um, whether it destroys your program or not, or destroys your results, entirely depends on the function that called it. It depends on uh, how the compiler laid this out, uh, you know, how much scratch space was needed, which optimization levels you specified, uh, how many registers the machine is targeting is, whether it's 64-bit architecture, 32-bit architecture, all these sort of things come into play which is how come, as I keep hammering away on here, this code might work fine on one computer, but will totally crash on another computer, um, or it might even depend on what compiler optimization levels I set. Then you can imagine the nightmare that's involved in trying to track out uh, one of these things. Uh, somebody comes to us and says, my code's not working, and, and you look at it, and you know it's one of these situations, and, it's a, it's a pretty uh, depressing thing because you have to get a really, really detailed understanding of the code to be able to figure this out and spend a lot of time um, going over them. So this is part of the reason uh, Valgrind is such a great tool. Uh, so I'll just save this here. Um, so this, this completes the sort of overview. Hopefully, I'm wanting to remove um, the black box image we have of of how a program works. And I'm really wanting to emphasize that there's a lot that can go wrong um, that that can ha have very, very hard to debug and may not necessarily show up. It just shows up as you. So as you build your program up incrementally, you really want to make sure each of the components is correct. Um, so what is Velgrind? Velgrind is a, a, a a binary instrumentation framework. And what it actually does is it goes to that area where your code is and it translates it. So it takes your instructions and it generates new instructions that do the same thing as the previous instruction, but they also keep track of all sorts of records. Uh, so they track the memory uses, they track the registers used by the program. And uh, on top of this framework that does this translation is a whole bunch of tools that, uh, that implement different calculations based on that. So the most common one and the one we'll be discussing and demoing very shortly here is MemChecker. And this though goes to great pains to try memory you've allocated, memory you release, to add big empty spaces around your memory blocks, to catch overwrites, um, to so it, it changes it changes your a regular program into another program that has a whole lot of memory checking going on that will catch a lot of these cases. Uh, cache grind's an interesting one as well. This gets into the profiling question. Cat mem check and cache grind are probably the, the two most common ones. Cache grind actually keeps track of statistics on on your processor cache. So you you got your main memory, which is uh, you know gigabytes. Then you got your L3 cache, which is which is actually physically stored on the processor. It's a lot faster. So when you're doing read and writes, um, it loads main memory into this cache, which might be, a, say, four megabytes of size. Uh, 
And as long as you keep reading and writing those same values, it's faster. And then on top of your L3 cache, you have an L2 cache. And then finally, right, really close to the system that's doing the actual executing the instructions on the CPU there is the L1 cache, which might be just, say, four kilobytes in size. Um, so cache grind determines uh, how well you're doing at utilizing those caches. So it can, it can point to parts in your program where you may want to think about laying out the memory difference to get that extra speed. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other ones, a heat profiler, a couple thread. Um, threading can be a real nightmare too uh, in terms of race conditions. Um, so there's Hellgrind and DRD, which uh, will pick up a lot of these sort of threading issues, just as MemCheck picks up a lot of the memory errors. And then there's a couple experimental tools as well. Um, so personally, I've only used MemCheck and cache grind. Uh, so now the advantages of this one here is you don't have you can run it on any executable. You just take the executable, you run it, it translates it into a new one in, on the fly in the memory um, that has all these items. Lots of other libraries like memory debugging libraries, you have to link in a special uh, memory allocation routine that tries to do some of the same stuff. Um, and it's because it's a dynamic translation, it's an ultimate instrumentation. Like the, these tools can can be, you know, the, the sky's the limit in terms of what a person might imagine if you're a Belgrind developer in, um, in, in making one of these tools. The disadvantage is you're, uh, <laughs> you know, you're translating the program, so there's time overhead for that. And not only that, you're changing one instruction into many instructions. So you can have a five to 100 times slowdown, depending on exactly what tool you're using. Um, the code, of course, is getting bigger because so you have a two, 12 to 18 times an increase in the size of the translated case. And then there's some corner cases that can exist where the translated code um, is, does not actually do what the original code does, or it doesn't know how to translate the original instruction um, generally, this sort of thing occurs when you're using high optimizations and, you know, you're using architecture compilations. You're saying, oh, let's target this latest architecture and it's got some sort of special instruction in it that, you know, the Belgrind developers haven't put into Belgrind yet. So um, just don't turn on your crazy optimizations and, and that basically takes care of that. Uh, correct code when you enable the optimizations, it'll still work. So you can do your debugging in the non-optimized one. And then to address these slowdowns, just run on small test cases. Uh, doesn't, you know, <laughs> the time putting together a small test case compared to the time spent hours and hours and days of trying to figure out one of these complex bugs is well worth it. Um, so the memcheck tool, which is the one we're gonna look at here, is a default Belgrind tool, detects several of the common memory errors. Um, we talked about, so overrunning, underrunning heat locks, so that's addressing past the start or the end. Uh, overrunning the top of the stack, so it'll catch it if you step out here. Unfortunately, uh, there's no way it knows. If it sees an instruction that says load an address, um, it doesn't know was that instruction a valid instruction or not, right? It's perfectly valid for you to access your argument. Um, it has no way of knowing whether you actually want to access a local variable or an argument, so it won't catch most of those. Um, using uninitialized values, it'll pick that up. Um, incorrect use of several functions. It, it, it has special support for various functions to ensure that the, those functions are being used in the correct case. For, for example, the string copy command, um, the, the re two regions of memory you specify are not supposed to overlap, so it'll check to make sure that. Um, their allocation and release calls, C++ actually has, as an example, um, an array allocation is separate from a non-array allocation, although on most machines, they're actually implemented underneath with the same malloc calls, so that doesn't show up. But your program's technically incorrect if, if you're not keeping those fruit the same. So if you do an array new followed by a non-array delete, um, your program is buggy, and on some machines it might not work. So Belgrind keeps track of that and we report it. Uh, if you release memory that hasn't been allocated and knows about that, it tracks your memory allocation so it can report not releasing it and tell you where that memory was allocated. Big help in, um, you know, if your program just keeps using more and more and more and more and more memory till it crashes, uh, Belgrind can help you to t figure out where you're not letting that memory go. All right, so let's have a look on the system here. Um, so here I am on my own computer. I'm going to use the uh, the Graham the Graham uh, Compute Canada system. So 
Uh, I guess that's just because I'm from SharpNet, but this works fine on Cedar as well. So I uh, log in here. I've got uh, several example pieces of code under my Valgrind directory here, just a couple of these problems. Um, so I want to use Valgrind, so I do module load Valgrind. Uh, this will warn me that uh, the Valgrind is not found, and I should use the module spider command. So if I spider for Valgrind, uh, I can see I'm going to use version 3.140. So I'll get a list here of what it wants. Um, and Valgrind here is saying it needs GCC and OpenMPI. So the default stack is the Intel stack, uh, which tends to be a, a less good idea because the Intel um, is much more inclined to generate the, the uh, special instructions and stuff. Um, it's probably really the open M, this particular OpenMPI is compiled against that GCC is what's causing me to do this, but uh, you can do that, so I'll load. GCC, I'll load the corresponding open MPI, uh, and then I'll load my Bellagrind. There we go. Uh, and now that I have my Bellagrind command. Uh, now the default application, you can see there's a whole a whole ton of, of options you can look up on the, the website. But by default, you just run your program and its arguments, and it uses the default tool, which is MapCheck. So let's have a look at one of my examples here. Um, so I'm just going to load up a text editor so I can keep the example up on the screen while I'm talking. Uh, all right. So um, let's ha let's start with um, an overrun example. So overrun. Let's see. So here's some um, so a simple. Uh, bit of C code here. Uh, we allocate some memory. I'm checking to properly report if it isn't. Um, and then I allocated a size 10 and I indexed that size 10 and set it to 1. The problem here is this common error. Uh, and C indexes go from 0. So from 0 to 9, I've used all, up, all 10 spots. Uh, by allocating 10, I'm actually in the 11th spot, which is past the end of the memory I've allocated. Um, and then I freed the array and I return. So this program is incorrect. It, it should limit its, its access to 0 to 9 to fall within the uh, range of 10 that I asked for. So let's run this program here. I'll just open up a terminal inside of Emacs here to show you. So just compile it. Um, I, I'm turning on a bunch of, we'll just skip all that. Uh, now, frequently when you compile, if you add the minus G option, that adds debugging information, which writes into your binary uh, for each bunch of code, what line of the program that corresponded to. Um, so that's a good idea to add that. That allows Belgrind to actually report not just the function name that the error occurred in, but the, the line of, the actual line of code that gets. So I'm going to compile overrun. Here, I'll just call it overrun. Right. Run this program. Seems to run OK. But we know it's bad. This is an, one of these cases, an example, um, where I'm accessing past the, the end of the, the array here. And if I go back to my Inkscape documents, here, I'll just stick this over on this side here. Um, and I guess this is a uh, heap is probably what we want. I've done one of these allocations. I wrote past the end. I've probably uh, clobbered the chunk next size entry. Um, and that the program probably would crash at some later point um, if I did some more memory allocations. But as written now, there's no further memory allocation calls after that. I'm not, it's not walking this list of chunks. Um, so it seems to work OK. Now, let's run it under Belgrind. Stick Belgrind out front. I can put any arguments I want after. Um, and you can see, indeed, it's detected an invalid write of size 8. Uh, that's how many bytes is in a double at uh, overrun C line 14. That takes me here. Tells me where it was allocated. It's allocated in main at line 9. There we go. Now, if I change this program here, just to give an example,
or change that to nine, say, run under Valgrind again. Um, there, it said it ran fine. It, there was no memory leaks. There was one allocation, one free total of 80 bytes. Um, so there's a simple example of Valgrind catching an overrun. Let's have a look at a um, an underrun. Same sort of situation here. In this case here, I'm accessing minus one, so I'm actually stepping back. I'm going to hit this chunk size and status flags, uh, which may spectacularly affect the free call. Let's give it a call and run this here and see what happens. Under run dot C. I'll just run the program first. Yes. <laughs> So you can see here, um, let me just uh, scroll back in my buffer, my program crashed very badly. Um, and the error was error and underrun double free or corruption. Uh, so what happens here is this was my user data. I stepped back one, I destroyed this chunk and status flag stuff caused the free to explode because the, the this, this structure, the bookkeeping associated with my, my chunks, my memory allocations was ruined. And then it also, it, as Linux here, uh, gave a memory map dump, and you can see this sort of layout, the heap, um, some of the libraries that are linked into the program, uh, this area at the end, the VDS, the stack space, the VDS OVS is called, that's the Linux uh, section at the end. Here's the actual memory addresses here. This is readable, this is executable, this is readable and writable, the stack is readable and writable, um, and so on. So there's some of that stuff showing up. Uh, so let's run it under Valgrind. Uh, you can see <laughs> that's a bit of a nightmare when you get one of those trying to debug it. I run it under Valgrind, I get a much better diagnostics here. It says invalid right of size 8, uh, underrun C line 14, Valloc was allocated at line 9. So here we are again, it's saying a problem here. Here's where you actually did your allocation. Um, so that helps you get uh, Makes, certainly makes that a lot easier to, uh, to debunk. So there's some overruns, there's some underruns. Um, let's have a look at some of the free allocations. So um, have a look at this access free. In this case here, I allocate the memory, um, I free the memory, and then I still use it. Okay? Now our understanding of how this works is uh, I'm going to get away with this, right? So here's, it's going to allocate this chunk of memory. We say this top block here will become allocated. Um, then I'm going to free it. It's going to add these, these records here. Um, but I'm still going to have a big chunk of, of unused. And then I access the fourth element in. So I'm going to access in far enough that I'm going to hit into this area here. And I'm not going to destroy the glibc structure. Um, that'll all be OK. Uh, and that memory is not been, I haven't done any new allocations after, so this memory hasn't been reassigned to any other parts of the program. So this program will actually run okay without crashing. And we can see that here, access free.c, uh, we'll add the minus g, output to access free. Now, if I run it on, I mean, it's a very fragile program, though, right? If I free this and I had some more code in here that does another allocation, this could be used again, um, in which case now I'm going to overwrite some other part of my data, um, and then that will die. And I won't know why it's got those strange values, and it's going to be very hard to debug. Now, if I run it under Valgrind, it, 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 uh, it gets in there, it modifies those allocations, it stretches these out, it adds big empty chunks on there, it tracks whether uh, memory has is, is been freed or not, it's, it's modifying those write instructions so they actually uh, do checks to see if they're writing to an area that has been freed, and that will allow it to give me a nice report here, which is right here, invalid write of size 8, it's 32 bytes inside of a block of size 80, freed at uh, line 14, that block was allocated at line 9, um, and the access happened at line 17. So there we are, here's the access line 17, the free statement 
line 14, and the original allocation, line 9. So you can really see that, uh, you know, what, what was an extremely hard situation uh, to debug has now become a, uh, a very easy situation to debug. So let's have a look at a double free. Um, this is an error here where I free the data and I free it again. Uh, and that's violating the, the assumptions of the allocation routines, which is that one allocation is not free. Um, so I'll just compile this one up here. And run it. Now exactly what happens is going to depend on the, the implementation of the uh, of the, the C, free, C routine. Uh, in this case, I believe the status flag, there's a status flag set um, that marks, we'll say, whether it's in the allocated or the unallocated state. So the second call to the free um, will read that status flag and say, whoa, this area has already been freed and it will err. Uh, but now imagine if I did an allocation, I did a free, I did another allocation, um, which reuse that area, and then I refreed the original one again. When it checks that status flag, it's going to see that that area is allocated. It's going to think that free is a valid free, and it's going to cause me grief. Uh, that's not the particular case of this program, but that's a more advanced uh, example. In this case here, again, the program explodes in a nasty manner, um, and I'm pretty sure if we scroll up to the top here, we will have a, a double free or corruption. And it gives me this number. So that's my error report. Uh, let's run it under Valgrind. Uh, it says invalid free or delete uh, at, uh, oh, I forgot to see here's an example of, of um, I forgot to include the the G flag when I compiled, so it's just giving me the name of the, the routine that was running. So let's recompile this here with the G flag, so include line number information, uh, rerun this here, and now we have our line numbers. So, um, so a double free at line 17, um, it was originally freed at line 14, and it was allocated at line 9. So again, a very nice um, set of, of directions on that. Uh, now another typical example of stuff that can go wrong is, a, is an access to a free. Um, which I'm pretty sure I already talked about. Yes, indeed. Um, so we can have a, a missing free. So let's have a look at no free. In this case, I allocate the memory program there's no matching free, right? So if this program ran for a long time and had several of these that maybe in some sort of loop eventually and run out of memory and uh, the operating system would be forced to terminate it. Um, but if I just run this as, as it is, uh, it's not going to report any sort of errors. Um, the only error I'm going to get is in a more advanced program is that it would eventually run out of memory. Uh, so not terribly helpful for tracking down this. We run it under Valgrind, and it's not reporting any errors. There's no errors in the sense that uh, you know I'm writing into areas I shouldn't, but it says, okay, hold on. When you exited here, there was 80 bytes still uh, allocated uh, associated with this array, array of size 10. Each entry is eight bytes. Um, so we definitely lost track in your program of that. It says, rerun with leak check full. Um, so leak check full is not on by default because that's even more additional instrumentation, um, which makes the program slower, take more space. But when you're tracking down memories, you'll want to add that in. Let's run it here. And now we're getting somewhere here. So we say, uh, okay, there's 80 bytes were lost and it was allocated at line nine, which is the best it can do, right? It can't tell me where I should have put the free statement, but it'll at least track me down and say, Okay, memory was allocated, it was allocated here, it was never released. You're going to have to go back to your program, figure out where this should have been released and why it's not being released. Ah, so that's a no free. Let's have a look at a, uh, a, a, a case of an overlap. Um, 
So this is an incorrect use of a library function. Here I'm calling the, so I, I have an example string. I find the space in it. Um, and then I copy from here, example string back over top of the top start. So I change string from an example string to example string. Or at least that's what I do in the ideal world. If I actually look up the man page here for um, the string copy command, I can see at the top here, it says, uh, it says, strings may not overlap, right? That is to call it, for this function to re run properly, you cannot be passing an overlapping string. Uh, that's because it's not checking. And depending whether it copies from the front or to the back and where I've lined those up, I could wind up with a mess. It could be halfway through copying and run into the bytes that are being copied. It entirely depends on the implementation of string copy. So this program is definitely wrong. I have violated the conditions associated with string copy. Let's see if it uh, runs though. Right, runs fine. Uh, so what happened? I got lucky. The order, the, 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 the number of entries it reads at once to make those copies, it reads some bytes and then it'll write them. Um, and the, the direction it's traveling in that string just so happens that I got away with it. But the program's wrong. A different implementation of string copy, you know, maybe I compile it with the Intel compiler um, and uh, it has an optimized implementation of string copy that reads larger bytes or different ordering, um, my program will suddenly stop working on that machine. So these are kind of problems that are nasty. Um, or, you know, you graduate at the next poor grad student comes along a couple years later, tries to run your program, different compiler, their life is not very good. Um, oh, I forgot to add the G flag here again. So I'll add that to get the line numbers. Uh, and we'll run this under Belgrind, see what Belgrind has to say about it. And it says, oh, source and destination overlap and string copy detected. Have main line 14, right? Fix it up. So I can fix that bug. So I hope you're getting the idea that, you know, even if your code runs, you should still run it under Belgrind. Because it'll pick up bugs um, that are in your code, and this will save you a lot of grief. Now, let's look at uh, an, another interesting case of value here. I'm getting down near the end. I've realized that I've kind of gone over. It's being recorded though, so I'd like to get the full, the full set in. Um, we're gonna look at a, a, uh, an uninitialized value. So here's a program. It, has an array of size 10, um, and then I start doing things without ever having set those values. So what's going to be in the array of size 10? Well, let's go look at our, our um, sorry, just let me see which windows I have open. Um, let's go look at our stack diagram. Because this is a, a, a local value, so it'll be allocated on the stack. So local variable zero here. Um, I haven't set them, so they're just going to have some random garbage in there, right? Uh, this is the very first time, so my stack is, you know, as I call function grows up, as I return from functions goes down, as I call more functions goes up, as I return for functions goes down. Uh, this is the very first time. It's going to be freshly allocated memory, so it's probably going to be zero. But you can imagine if this function got called later after you know a stack had gone up and a stack had gone down and a stack had gone up and a stack had gone down, what happens to be in the local variable zero slot if I haven't set it to anything? Could be anything. It's going to depend on, on the history of all my prior function calls. Um, so a wrong program. But in this case, I suspect it's going to print the result as zero. Although I don't know that for sure, right? Because the operating system sticks that memory in there on the request, and um, who knows? Very common class of problems we are, we see people struggling with. A very common one where the code worked on one computer doesn't work on another computer. Um, in this case, it's zero. Uh, all right, so 
Now let me run that under bell grind. I mean, the program is definitely wrong. There's indeterminism here, right? It should not be, the, the results of the program should not be depending on, on values that I have not initialized. And we get some error messages here. Uh, now these ones here are a little more complicated than you might expect. So it's, it's called out line seven, nine, and 11. Um, so here's seven, here's nine, and here's 11. And what it's saying is there's undeterminism in your code. Uh, so it's not necessarily wrong to, to access an uninitialized value. In fact, that ha sometimes happens. Um, you know, you have a for loop or something. The compiler says, oh, I can preload this value. It'll move an allocation outside. Uh, what is wrong is if the flow of your program depends on that value. Because as soon as, as soon as there's a, a, a branch in your program and which direction you take um, depends on a value that wasn't set, now the outcome of your program is undetermined. Uh, I can do some calculations on some unknown value if I throw away the results and I don't care in the end, which happens sometimes when compilers are optimizing code. So what it will warn you about is when there's a branch in your program and that branch is determining what the, the value that, that branch is checking um, was it had at some point an, an uninitialized value got added in there, in, in which case that result is nonsense. So the program has to be wrong. Uh, so in this case, you have to go back and you have to look and you have to say, oh, okay, why look at these statements? And I say, okay, it's the, the fourth array value is not initialized somehow. And then I have to dig back up to my program and say, okay, it should have been set here. Why isn't it being set? Um, and in this case, I just forgot to, to zero the array. Uh, now, in terms of numerical code, where you'll see this most common is people forget to zero their, you know, they'll be summing some values or something and they forget to zero it. Uh, so it goes through the entire numerical computation. And then when they print the results, it'll give an error at that point. And the reason is, is because the print statement, you know, it looks at the number and it, if it's, it, if the range is, it, you know, it does modulus by 10 and stuff to convert it into it. So it strips off the bottom number and it says if it's a, if it's a zero, then print a zero. If it's a one, then print a one. Like you actually look at the implementation of printf. So generally uh, in numeric code, this will, this will be an error that'll be called on a, a printf statement and say uh, this, this value I'm printing is uninitialized. And generally that means that you know, you've calculated some statistic on your data and you forgot to initialize the, the, uh, the value that you're summing, to, that the accumulator that you're doing your sum in to zero or uh, you know, you're doing some sort of multiplication, maybe it should have been initialized to one or whatever that initial value should have been that was missing from your program. And this is a very common class where the, the program seems to work okay on one computer um, I had one user come in, I remember some Fortran code I was working on, and it, it was giving not, you know, on his computer it was giving the right results, on our computer it was giving the wrong results, uh, program was wrong in both cases. The, the issue was that they were doing an accumulation uh, and they had forgot to set it to, to a, an initial value of zero. All right, um, now we're getting right down near the end of the ones I had wanted to show you. Uh, so I'll just show you there's just two more. There's a, another example of, of uh, function use. So this here is actually some C++ code. Um, <laughs> and in this case, I'm using the new call. It's an array I'm allocating, an array of 10, so that's new. And then I'm freeing it, so I'm deleting it. So in this case, C++, if you allocate an array, you should be freeing with the array one, not with a standard delete one. Um, under the hood on Linux, though, uh, it all goes to malloc calls. Um, let's have a look at what this does. Oops, if I compile it with this compiler, plus plus compiler. All right, so we run pairing, uh, nothing, right? But the code is wrong, and on some machines, uh, some cases where they differentiate between an array and a non-array, that's actually different routines. Uh, this could go very badly wrong. So I run it under bell grind, except it says mismatch, read, delete, delete bracket operator um, on pairing line 12, allocated on line seven. I can go up here and I can look at it, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, okay, you know, I forgot. 
to match those two up. Um, and then finally, the final example I want to show you is a stack overwrite. Um, what this one does here is I've got two arrays. So we go back to our stacks. We've got local variable zero and local variable one um, of size 16. I set them, the, um, the first one to zero. Um, and then I set position uh, 18 and the second one to one, and then I print out the two arrays. So we're going to have here is local variable zero will be here, local variable one will be sitting above it. Um, I access out past the end of the sec first one, so access is yeah, down in memory. I'm going to step inside of local variable zero, so I'm going to I'm going to wind up here. Uh, since I'm outside of array one, I'm going to access whatever is next in memory. What's next in memory, this is on the stack, will be array zero. So I'm actually going to change in a value in array zero um, right here by accessing past the end of array one. And we'll see what the, what Valgrind does here in this case. Um, first of all, we'll just run it. So GCC stack overwrite.c stack overwrite run stack overwrite. And you can see, uh, although the only thing I ever set array 0 to was 0, by the end of this program, when I print array 0, it's got a 1 in it. Okay. And that's because I went past the end of array 1, uh, which was up above it, uh, past the end, and so that right went into array 0. Uh, so let's see what happens when we run this under Valgrind. And you can see I get the exact same error with no warning messages whatsoever. And the reason is, is because, and, and this is why I included this example, I want to tell you, even if your program runs under Valgrind, fine, it can still contain bugs. Uh, so the fact that it runs under Valgrind is a huge insurance and removes a large class of problems, uh, but it does not mean that your program is fine. And the reason there is no, Belgrind cannot do anything here, because Belgrind is looking at the instructions the assembler wrote. When the, when the, when the, I mean the compiler. When the compiler writes the instructions for this, it generates a store instruction. That just says store one at this memory location. That's the exact same instruction it generates as if I, if I put this line in. Array 0, 2 equals 1.0. Both of these lines will generate the exact same instruction to the computer. Belgrind can only look at the instructions. It can say, that instruction looks valid. Um, that could have been from, maybe they wanted to change something in local variables here. I don't know. Uh, so it, it, in this case, it can't tell you that you've done something wrong. Because again, the program generated by that and the program generated by that are the exact same program. And uh, so Val and, and this one's a perfectly valid program. So Valgrind has no way of being able to tell you something went wrong there. Um, so anyway, that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, hopefully, maybe uh, unblack boxed um, some of the items of programming and you get a better idea of uh, how we move from just a von Neumann machine where you just have this very abstract contents of memory, memory containing code, memory containing um, data and the processor running the code bit and that code bit fudging around with the data bit to massage it into the answer to uh, the sort of modern structure we've imposed on top of that where you've got to you know, you've got your program in separate areas of memory. You've got the, the mapping, um, the physical memory being assigned and maintained by the operating system. You're having holes in, in a program's address space, that is, areas that doesn't have memory. Only when you access one of those holes or you access it in a way that it's not marked for, so you try to write to a region that's marked as only being readable, do you get a segmentation fault. Everything else, no segmentation fault. Uh, so a huge class of problems that will not generate a segment fault. Many, many ways for a program to be wrong and not segment faulting. Uh, whether it's segment faults or not can be very dependent on the, the particulars of how, how this stuff is supposed to be implemented. Um, so a correct program will be correct everywhere. A wrong program, it's, the jury's outright. It, it totally depends on how things went. 
what, what function calls were made earlier, what function calls were made later, what happened to be the prior contents of memory. Uh, bell grind, extremely useful tool, pick up a large number of these cases for you. Uh, very useful for extremely hard to debug situations. Uh, but again, not everything, right? There's still stuff that goes through. So you just have to, you <laughs> yeah, programming can be hard. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for attending. Thanks for sticking around. I, I know I went nearly half an hour longer than there was. Um, but uh, so if there's any questions, I'll be around here. Thank you, Tyson. Uh, now time for questions. You can unmute yourself and ask via audio, or you can type the question in the chat window. So I guess I have a couple of very quick questions. One of them is, uh, what languages can you use Valgrind with? So it's not only C, C++, but I assume also Fortran and other compiled languages? Yes, that's correct. Belgrind, um, you can run it on any binary. So the main thing is you want to be able to add that uh, line number debugging information yes. to the binary is a big help because then I'll tell you specific lines in the source code. But it, it doesn't actually depend. Uh, it works on the machine code level, so it will run on any binary. Okay. And the second question, I noticed in, in the name of the module, a description of the module, there was mention of MPI. So I assume it works also for MPI codes? It does. There's a, some pretty big caveats around that here. Let me just open up um, a, a new browser window here. Um, so if we go to, uh, um, to docs.computecanada, um, there's a there's a there's a bit of a, a description of bell grind here, uh, but using it with so remember how the, like the string um, copy command it gave additional feedback. So bell grind has hooks that uh, other libraries can add into it that perform checks on those as well. So there's a series of hooks that perform checks on your MPI call. Uh, if you and there's also suppression files that uh, eliminate false errors. So if you just run it on an MPI out of the box, you'll get a lot of false errors. It'll think you're reading values that aren't initialized. And the reason is is because when you're doing an MPI send, um, the program that's doing the receive has never itself initialized those values. Those are generally streamed directly into the memory by the network system. So it'll be reporting you as accessing memory that hasn't been set and it'll be a real mess. Uh, so in this case, and this documentation needs to be moved, if we go to SharpNet in Valgrind, um, we look at the SharpNet webpage. Uh, I wrote this up, here we go. Uh, there's, a, there's a series here, uh, MPI code uh, about uh, adding in the, uh, the, the MPI wrapper library um, that you want to run it that way, which will, will remove all these bogus error messages and also does a whole bunch of checking of your MPI functions to ensure that, you know, they're properly paired and so on. So you can get very good uh, MPI, but it, it's not just a, a straightforward run of Belgrind. Okay. I mean, maybe there should be another uh, talk on, on that actually. Okay, that's great. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, you can always uh, ask us a question by email. So you can send an email to info at westgrid.ca and we can forward Belgrand questions to Tyson. So the, and the recording of this talk are gonna be posted. I, um, I, I pasted the link. Oh, uh, there's a question. Are there equivalent tools for interpreted languages in the chat window? Um. I mean, Belgrind can run on an interpreted language, right? Because ultimately the language is machine instructions that's running. But again, there's lots of the, uh, the interpreters are performing all sorts of tricks underneath. They're not necessarily releasing all the memory at the end and stuff like that. So there can be a large number of, of uh, false reports. So I've used it uh, on interpreted languages to track down problems. But 
it's certainly not uh, as easy as it is, is on, uh, on non-interpreted languages. Uh, and I guess, I've, I've, and also a lot of these problems in interpreted languages are, these are low level problems with, caused by, you know, like C not doing array bounds check and stuff like that. So a, a lot of these problems go away in interpreted languages. Um, so I guess I don't know if there's an exact sort of equivalent that would provide this functionality with an interpreted language, but it's definitely aimed more at, at low level stuff. Um, I believe the case I was using on interpreted language was actually uh, debugging a library for that interpreted language that uh, was a low level language, but had a, you know, a, a, hack, a Python interface. Um, but it, the, the low level part was buggy, which was then causing problems on the Python side. So. Yeah, but you know, like for example, these array things where I'm accessing past the end, if you do that in Python, it checks your boundaries and it'll give you an error message. Okay. Uh, so thanks everybody. And especially thank you, Tyson, for this very informative presentation.